Well, good morning and welcome to Buffalo Covenant Church. I want to read to you from Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. I invite you to stand as you're able and lift your voice as we sing praises to God, our creator.
Good morning. Good morning to you and welcome and thank you so, so very much for being with us here at Buffalo Covenant Church. We worship an amazing God, amen? Amen. He is indescribable, he is unattainable, he is absolutely amazing and he's madly in love with you. And he loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die a terrible death on a cross to take away your sins so you would have an eternal hope, Amen? amen? Amen. If you don't believe that, come find me today, come talk to me today, and you need to know that truth before you leave this building today. We have a whole team of staff, of pastors and elders that want to share the good news of Jesus Christ with you. So I hope you will take me up on that offer after this service. My name is Dave McAlina. God has given me the absolute privilege of serving on staff here at Buffalo Covenant Church. It's a pleasure to uh, serve you in all the ways that we can here at BCC. If you're a guest or if you're a visitor to Buffalo Covenant Church this morning, a special welcome to you, and we thank you so much for being with us this morning. We'd love to take a moment and greet you out at our Welcome Center, share about the ministries of Buffalo Covenant Church, hear about you and your family, so please consider doing that right outside these doors. You'll see us standing back there just ready to meet you and greet you. So thank you so much for being here this morning. Um... Church family, I want to encourage you to think about small groups, all right? Think about if you've been part of a small group, maybe you have been in the past and you're not currently, or maybe you're in one right now, though, but here at Buffalo Covenant Church, community life in that small group is an important part of our discipleship ministries, connecting you with other families, walking life with other families here at Buffalo Covenant Church. That's true for singles, that's true for families with little ones, for empty nesters, for widows, it's for everybody. And we love to connect you with a small group. So we have a table set out right out here. You'll see it as you go through these doors in our lobby. Uh, We'll have some of our staff out there sharing as well. There's a sign up there that you can just jot your name down if you're interested in joining a small group here at Buffalo Covenant Church. We'd love to get you connected into a small group. So please consider doing that. Also, just remember that there's Sunday school for all ages right after this service. From 10 to 11, uh, there is Sunday school for littles and all the way up to adults. This morning in the gym, we're going to highlight one of our newer ministries at Buffalo Covenant Church called Doors of Freedom. They actually have a special guest this morning here. Doors of Freedom is a newer ministry at Buffalo Covenant Church that's stepping into the world of human trafficking, the dark, dark world of human trafficking, and how we here in central Minnesota, how we here at Buffalo Covenant Church can respond in prayer and in information and communication. And so please join us right after the service in the gym for that special time with Doors of Freedom. After services today, everybody's invited to soup and prayer. We do this once a month where we spend time together as a church family in prayer together for a number of different things here. And uh, at 12.15 here, you, will, you can join us for a time of prayer. What a great way to kick off a beautiful beautiful summer Sunday afternoon because this is it for summer actually. It's over after today if you looked at the forecast. So we hope you had a great summer this year. And this week, great ministry continues here. Our membership series, which we've talked about a little bit on Sunday mornings, highlighting becoming a member here. That kicks off tomorrow night. It's a three-part series taught by Pastor Mark in the first session, myself in the second session, and then Pastor Joel in the third session as well. So three consecutive Monday nights. If God is tapping you on the shoulder right now and nudging you into membership here at BCC, come find us, come talk to us, sign up for the class tomorrow night. We'd love to have you for that. And then next week... Uh, After services next week, there's an informational meeting about our summer Mexico mission trip. Missions is a big deal here at Buffalo Covenant Church, and this could be the opportunity for you to leave this country, to leave this community, and bring the hope of Jesus Christ with you 
to another country. So please consider joining that. Uh, registration will open for the, uh, the Mexico mission trip, which is in high demand, actually, um, after that meeting there uh, next Sunday. So we encourage you to be there for that April 21st, 12, 15, here at the church. Please consider joining us in that. Church family, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Would you please now stand, find someone new, ask them if they had a good summer yesterday. Well, please remain standing, and I invite you to sing with us. Oh 
Thank you, music team. This morning we're picking up where we left off a couple weeks ago in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 13 will be our text. So take out your Bibles. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's one in the seat back in front of you, and it'll be on page 925. 
And if you haven't been following along with our series or you are on vacation in Florida or Colorado or you're just new, you can catch up and listen to those messages by going to our Buffalo Covenant website or downloading the app and you can catch up that way in the series. But we're in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 13 and please rise if you're able for the reading of God's word. This then is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign, and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we might also reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. Here ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. How do we judge who is a successful leader? How do we define success? If you were to Google on your phone the word success, you would probably have pop up the Oxford Dictionary definition. And it says this, the accomplishment of an aim or a purpose. The accomplishment of an aim or a purpose. But then right under that, it'll say, the attainment of fame, wealth, or social status. A person who achieves fame, wealth, or social status is a successful person. Now that's interesting to me that the world hasn't changed its definition of success in 2,000 years. How their culture, how the Corinthians, how even many American Christians define success as those who have the most power, wealth, and fame. And we tend to want to be successful, and so we look to politicians and business moguls and musicians and actors and influencers, and we imitate them. Since 1927, Time Magazine has put forth their person of the year, the most successful person. And it started with Lindbergh and Chrysler and Gandhi and Roosevelt, There's a lot of presidents in there, business moguls and celebrities mixed in. For example, since 2020, here are Time Magazine's People of the Year. President Biden, Elon Musk, President Zelensky, and Taylor Swift. (laughs) Now, in the church, we might have some various thoughts about how successful those people are. And yet, 
over and over again when I travel the world and get to be friends with Christians from other countries, and we get to the point where we can have an com- honest conversation, I like to ask them what they think American Christians are aiming for. And oftentimes, it's something like the American dream, that we are proud and boasting how we are the greatest nation ever because we have achieved political power, material wealth, and worldwide cultural popularity through music and movies. Power, wealth, and fame. Is that greatness? Is that success? The Apostle Paul in our passage this morning wants to get the Corinthians to have a very different perspective on how they view what is a successful leader. You see, the Corinthians are judging and boasting and pitting one leader against another, and he wants to show them that their criteria for judging success is all wrong. So let's take a look at the text, starting in verses 1 through 5. And again, that's on page 925 in your seatback Bibles. In verse 1, he says, This then is how you ought to regard or think about us. The us there is the apostles. It's Paul and Apollos and Peter, those who are their spiritual leaders that they're pitting against one another. And he says, You should think about us spiritual leaders as servants of Christ as those entrusted with the mysteries that God has revealed. Talked about a couple weeks ago that that word servants is where we get the word deacon, but really what it meant was an employee, a household manager. And so first of all, Paul says, think about us just as employees. We're not the master, we're household managers. And what we've been entrusted to manage is the gospel, that Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins and that he rose again from the dead. In verse two, he says, now what makes a good employee, what makes a good manager is faithfulness. It's reliability. It's can you be trusted to do what the boss has asked you to do? You see, God defines success by faithfulness. Obedience is his love language. Each and every one of us has been given a ministry assignment. You have been given a race. You have been given talents and power and position and different things that God has put in your life and he's called you to run that race in obedience to him. That is success as God defines it. Faithfulness is success. And furthermore, if you look at verses three and four, he says that ultimately only God can judge faithfulness. Why? Because it's only God who really knows people's secrets and people's hearts. God sees beyond what people see to what is really going on. Paul says, I don't even judge myself. Okay, brief side note. This is why in our culture, look inside yourself to determine your identity. Be true to yourself. You do you. Live your truth are terrible ideas because you don't even totally know your heart. And so Paul says, I don't even judge myself. My conscience is clean. I'm not keeping any secrets. And yet, I'm not omniscient, I'm not God. I'm not qualified to judge even my own heart. And so verse five, therefore, judge nothing. Stop making superficial judgments about people's motivations and heart and who's the better or more successful leader before Christ's return. Because he's the only one qualified to judge true success, which is faithfulness to what God has called a person to do. So Paul says, judge nothing before Jesus return when he will judge everything. Now someone will say to me, Pastor Joel, if Paul says judge nothing before Christ return, does that mean that we should just accept everybody? Is the culture's criticism that the church is just so judgmental, is that fair? 
What about discernment? What about false teachers? And also, when our cause is winning people to Christ, why wouldn't we want to have the person who draws the most people? Don't the ends justify the means? Those are excellent questions. And this is why context matters. First of all, when Paul says, judge nothing before Christ's return, he has to be talking about a specific kind of superficial judgment. Why? Because in just the next chapter, which we will talk about in a couple weeks, Paul calls on the Corinthians to judge a leader in their church who is proud and boasting about a sexually immoral relationship. And Paul says, kick him out of the church. Judge him. Now that sounds awfully intolerant and judgmental to our culture, but it would be faithfulness to God's word. Furthermore, you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and here the Corinthians are suing each other in public court. And Paul says, are you kidding me? Don't you know that you saints are going to judge, same world, word, the world. You don't have anybody in your midst that can settle a dispute between two believers. You don't know how to judge. You get to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 and 34, and Paul says that because of how the Corinthians are dishonoring and treating one another as they take the Lord's Supper, that some of them are weak and sick and dying before their time. And if they would judge themselves, they wouldn't be judged by the Lord in this way. So clearly, Paul does not mean make no judgments. What the converse, con- context makes clear is that they are not to make superficial judgments about a, one Christian leader's success over against another. They can't judge a person's heart. They don't know a person's secrets and backstory. Only the Lord is faithful to judge who is truly successful. And he will reward those believers for their faithfulness. Also, when it comes to false teachers and discernment, this is a big deal, right? By 2 Corinthians, Paul is calling on the Corinthians to judge the false apostles in their midst and kick them out. And so we have to have a clear picture of what does the Bible call a false teacher that we need to be on guard for. And in the New Testament, a false teacher is someone who denies an essential element of the gospel, like the deity or humanity of Jesus, or that we have all sinned and need to repent and turn to Jesus to forgive our sins, or the ones who are called out by name have denied the resurrection, right? That is the doctrine of false teachers, but it could also be someone who is claiming to be a Christian, but denying the lordship of Jesus in their life, by unrepentant sexual immorality, greed, idolatry, pride. False teachers really haven't changed all that much. They create their own little cults so that they can get rich off other people. They're often sexually immoral and they add to or subtract from the gospel. We have to make judgments, but we are not to be judgmental. We are not to make superficial judgments that have nothing to do with faithfulness to the gospel. D.A. Carson, in his book, A Model of Christian Maturity, which is about the Corinthians and Paul's response to them in 2 Corinthians, he says, I think, it perfectly. And So I'll quote from him. He writes this. Neither an individual Christian nor a church can avoid responsibility by refusing to make judgments. For that very refusal is in itself a judgment, an evaluation of commitments, strategies, and truth claims. What this means is that since we cannot avoid making judgments, we had better commit ourselves to making good ones. We will eschew cheap judgmentalism, remembering that we ourselves are at best poor sinners who have been saved by grace. We will constantly ask God for grace and wisdom to avoid decisions based on flattery, personal prejudice, faulty understandings of scripture, carelessness, or other impure or lazy motives. 
Instead, we will seek to be fair and just, to test everything by scripture, and to judge even-handedly on the basis of the immutables of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, D.A. Carson. (laughs) What he is saying is that you have to make decisions and judgments because even not making a decision is a judgment. And so don't make cheap judgments. Don't pit one leader against another and it has nothing to do with scripture, but totally based on their culture's values of what success is. And Paul wants them to see that success does not look like those who draw the biggest crowd, make the most money, or are the most dynamic or gifted. No, make good judgments based on scripture and the gospel. That's what Paul is calling the Corinthians to do. But then there's that second question. Why wouldn't we want the more charismatic, the more dynamic leader? If our cause is right and they draw the bigger crowd, doesn't the ends justify the means? And we're going to cover more of that next week, so I want to come back to that. But for now, I'll just say that the ends never justifies the means because you don't know the end. Only God does. And only what was faith-filled obedience to the master, what was spirit-led love, Galatians chapter five. That's the only thing that will last. Everything else will be burned up. The most dynamic, winsome communicators, leaders, are often not the best people. If their charisma exceeds their character, they're going to do more damage than good. And it may be burned up and crumble crumble in this lifetime, or it may burn up in the end. But leave it to Jesus to judge people's hearts and faithfulness. The ends never justifies the means because only Jesus knows the ends. And it's character, not charisma, faithfulness, not famousness, that ultimately matters. But the Corinthian problem... And our problem is even bigger. Because if success is the achievement of a desired end, what happens when you achieve that end? But the goal was to be powerful, wealthy, and famous. You see, that's what Paul moves to next. He undermines their aims, what their goal was, by comparing who they think they already are and how they want to be seen and treated by their world. He compares that to the apostles. Take a look at verses 6 through 13. 6 through 13. He says, Now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you can learn the meaning of the saying, don't go beyond what is written. Everything you have received is grace, so why are you boasting in your accomplishments? And then Paul lays in some heavy sarcasm. The Corinthians think that they are a success, that they are spiritually full, that they are rich, that they are reigning as kings. And Paul lays on the sarcasm and says, I wish that you were already reigning. If you were living your best life now, then surely us apostles would be too, right? But no, if you look at the apostles, no, we're like a spectacle to the whole universe. We're like those at the end of the procession condemned to die in the arena. Now this would have been a common scene in their world, not one in our world, but what Paul is drawing their attention to is that whenever a Roman general would return from victory, there would be a parade through the streets of Rome. And chained and marching between the Roman cavalry and soldiers would be all the prisoners that they had captured, dressed in rags, being led to the Colosseum to be executed or be slaves. They were the lowest of the low who had no rights, no wealth, had lost everything. Perhaps the modern example, if Paul were speaking today, he might say something like this. You all want to be interviewed as celebrities on late night while we apostles are on prime time for being on death row. And he goes on. He says, you Corinthians, your aim is to be so wise and strong and honored 
by your world, but look at us apostles. We're fools, we're weak, we're dishonored, we're poor, we're powerless, we're hungry, we're homeless, we're persecuted, we're verbally abused, and we're overall appalling to the world. Paul uses a word here that quite honestly most of us would complain if I were to use the word in church. So I'll illustrate instead. Paul says that we apostles are like the stuff that you're walking out in your yard and you step in and you go, ew. (laughs) And you scrape off the bottom of your foot. That's the image, the stuff that people would be walking along the roads and their roads were pretty nasty and they would step in and they'd scrape off the bottom of their foot. That's the word that Paul uses and the English tones it down to garbage or scum or Maybe the ESV gets the closest with refuse. But what Paul uses is the the word for the stuff you would scrape off the bottom of your foot. That's how the world sees the apostles. So why, Paul? Why set up this contrast between who their top spiritual leaders are and who they are aiming to be? Why use such an extreme word picture and offend these Corinthians? It's because he wants to radically change their definition of success. He is aiming to shock them out of what they are aiming for and how they are judging their leaders. The most successful person to have ever lived in all of human history is Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ. You know, I read this comment on YouTube. I couldn't get who exactly said it because they just had numbers behind their name, but I really liked it. He said this about Jesus. Jesus had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet the kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried, and yet he lives today. His name is Jesus. See, success is being like Jesus. And the more you become like Jesus, the more successful you really are. And the apostles who were very close to Jesus, they walked with him, they loved him, like John, who laid on his chest, who called himself the beloved, who said we've touched him and heard him with our own ears and we've seen him. He said loving Jesus, that's success. That's what it's all about is loving Jesus. Paul said I wanna know him in every way and be like him. I wanna know him in the power of his resurrection, but I wanna know him in his sufferings and even in his death on a cross. You see, the apostles in Jesus were the antithesis of what the world calls success. Their aim was not worldly power or wealth or fame. Jesus' aim was the cross, the symbol of weakness and shame and death. Jesus was and is hated by the world, rejected, cursed, mocked, called demon-possessed, called insane, was beaten and crucified. And Jesus is ultimate success. You know, Jesus himself prayed for his disciples and those who would become disciples through his disciples. This was his final prayer in John 17. He said, I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world even as I am not of it. Sanctify them, set them apart by the truth. Your word is truth. And as you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. If you want to be successful, aim to be like Jesus. And it looks like the cross centered life, it doesn't look like aiming for power and wealth and fame. But it's there at the cross. It's in losing your life. It's in following Jesus that you find true abundant life. 
that you find peace that passes understanding, that you find freedom from self-righteousness, that you find joy that can't be shaken, that you find contentment, whatever your circumstances, that you find hope that is eternal. When you set your aim on the cross and Jesus, that's where you find true blessedness and success. But you have to ask, if you're not carrying a cross, are you really following Jesus? Aim to be like him. And don't be surprised when the world treats you like they treated Jesus. Worship team, you can come on up. I was at D6 recently, and I heard this quote by Count Zinzendorf, who was an Austrian noble, who started a 24-7 prayer movement that became a missions movement that lasted a hundred years. He said this, and I thought it was pertinent for this culture. He said, preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. Preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. And the irony is that Zinzendorf hasn't been forgotten because he faithfully preached the gospel. And you see, that's the thing. When the end finally does come, we're gonna see that many, many, many who the world considered the weakest, the least valuable, the dumbest, were actually the greatest in the kingdom. And nobody knew their name, but they were the most faithful. And many who we thought were great and successful people of the year, Biden, Musk, Swift, They're going to be the least in the kingdom. So what about you? Are you going to be a success? Then aim to be like Jesus and the appalling apostles. Success isn't in worldly power, wealth, or fame. It's in being Christ-like. So don't be surprised when you're treated the same. I invite you to stand and sing with us a song about finding our worth in Christ and not in what we have.
hope you'll join us right after the service in the gym for a very special guest speaker about human trafficking in Minnesota. So please join us for that, and let's pray. God, we thank you for Christ. You, Jesus, are our only boast, and we want to be like you. We want to know you. So put in us as a church, as a people, as individuals and families, a desire to know you above all else. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.